Greetings, everybody. Dr. Frank here with a, a short video um, about a recent uh, case that uh, happened in Colorado uh, regarding um, two paramedics that were convicted um, of negligent homicide. Um, I just wanted to sort of talk about this and uh, sort of clear the air and uh, put everybody's minds at ease. Um, just so when you're out there treating patients, you're not afraid to follow protocol and use your training um, and think that, uh, you know, that this is a common occurrence. So this is obviously not a common occurrence. Um, and what I want to do is go over what transpired on this particular call and what transpired um, in the courtroom and so forth, because uh, this is the only case that I'm aware of um, in which um, EMS clinicians um, have been convicted of anything um, in a criminal court. So um, today is January 3rd. Um, thanks for joining me on this. Okay, um, first, what I'd encourage you to do is scan this QR code. This will bring you to a YouTube link of the body cam that was, uh, or several body cams that were worn by law enforcement officers uh, that were on the scene of the call. Um, it's about 25 minutes or so, so you could fast forward through it. Uh, but uh, what you'll see is that uh, when the paramedics got on scene, um, they didn't assess the patient. Um, they sort of acted in conjunction with law enforcement, um, uh, not advocating for the patient, not assessing the patient, not checking vital signs, not talking to the patient, not trying to de-escalate the patient. Um, they just gave a pretty high dose of uh, intravenous uh, ketamine um, and then uh, put them on the stretcher. So it's important that that you take a look at the video and, um, and um, you know, see maybe like, what would you have done different? Um, I personally see that um, um, if I was on the scene of that, the call, I'm not sure if I would have done much different, um, just seeing how it transpired. So it's a, it's a really good way for us to learn and, um, and sort of see how we can make changes. So uh, hopefully you had time to scan the QR code there. So what the charges were in this case, the criminal charges um, were uh, uh, reckless manslaughter, sorry, that's misspelled, um, criminally, criminally negligent homicide and assault, okay? And what they initially said was that, that they performed assault with a deadly weapon and what the deadly weapon was, was uh, ketamine. Um, and thankfully the judge in this case uh, threw that part out and said that ketamine is not a deadly we deadly weapon. Um, but uh, they were charged with reckless manslaughter and um, criminally negligent homicide. And what the verdict came out, um, this was just on January, on December 22nd, uh, both paramedics were found guilty of criminally negligent homicide. Okay, so that's scary um, that we're out there treating patients and, um, you know, just like we were seeing law enforcement officers um, in the recent years, um, getting convicted of crimes. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is have EMS clinicians who are out there caring for patients and doing their best with their training and their protocols to be afraid to care for patients. So that's, again, that's why I wanted to put this video out there to sort of put minds at ease. What the prosecution argued was the following, um, that they treated uh, Mr. McLean, his name was Elijah, Elijah McLean, um, as a problem and not a patient. And again, I'm sorry for my typo there. They failed to adequately attempt communication. So you'll see on the, on the body cam, they didn't talk to him. They didn't kneel down to talk to him. They didn't ask him if he was okay. Uh, they didn't consider getting a blood sugar on him. You know, this is a guy who really, they, he wasn't under arrest. He wasn't doing anything criminal. The, the police just stopped him because he was um, suspicious looking. Um, they also said that they failed to properly assess and monitor the patient, which you see in the video, uh, and I just talked about, and that they uh, administered an excessive dose of ketamine. Uh, so, you know, it's not in the in the system protocol, but it is in the uh, the captain's advanced protocol for um, for agitated um, behavior um, to give one milligram. I'm sorry, four milligrams per kilogram of ketamine intramuscularly, um, and you know we would estimate the, the the weight obviously but they uh they gave a, a 500 milligrams to this kid who um it was a pretty small skinny kid the defense argued uh that there was no proof that the paramedics caused the death um, they also argued that failure to provide proper medical care to a patient and making medical mistakes should not amount to criminal conduct um so that's what they're um 
that's what their uh, argument uh, on the uh, on the defense was. So what can we learn from this and uh, and how can we change and how can we be better? Um, so first, we had to increase our training, right? We train a lot and um, I think we have a great training program, um, but we need to increase our training and that includes training with law enforcement, right? So, you know, we, we know how to deliver patients to the hospital and give a report. Uh, we know how to take handover from patients in other, in other means, uh, but, you know, we should consider training with law enforcement and conducting realistic scenario-based training. Right. So we partner with them and uh, we do a scenario in which they're detaining a, 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 an aggressive person. And, um, you know, how do we help them and how do we determine whether the patient, the, the person is a patient and when the patient's ours? Um, so we need to define police to EMS handoff. OK, we need to allow EMS prompt access to the patient. When the when the paramedics are finding the patient in the police in police custody, um, and we obviously need to do it safely, but we need to allow EMS to have prompt access to the patient. And we have to understand that if the if we're being called by law enforcement, that this is now um, considered a medical issue. Okay, we we're not here to detain patients. We're not here to arrest page. We're not here to detain people. We're not here to arrest people. We're here to render medical care. So when we're asked to, to, to come assist uh, in situations like this, we have to understand that this is a medical problem until proven otherwise. We need to focus on the patient's needs. Uh, we need to not focus on law enforcement's needs. I'm not saying that, you know, by any means that, you know, we don't want to assist them, but we need to understand that the reason we're being called is to assist the patient. Um, if restraint and sedation are indicated, it must be for the sole purpose to promote treatment um, that's in the patient's best, best interest, right? So, you know, people with agitated uh, behavior, you know, pose a threat to themselves and to others. And so it is appropriate sometimes to, to restrain and sedate these patients if they're posing a threat to themselves, right? Are they going to run out into traffic? Are they going to uh, injure themselves, you know, uh, in handcuffs or other restraints? You know, you can get rhabdomyolysis by... Uh, by uh, you know, um, but with these people being so agitated, it's it's a it's a dangerous situation and it's a high stakes situation. So we have to understand that if we're going to restrain and sedate these people, sometimes that's appropriate, but it's for the it's for, to promote treatment for what's in the patient's best interest. Um, and also, we have to understand that we we need to bring our tools to the to the patient's bedside. Um, in this case, if you watch the uh, the body cam video, there was no monitor ever brought to the patient's side. Um, there is no blood sugar, sugar checked. Um, we need to make sure that we don't let these people who are in, you know, potentially in custody of, of law enforcement or acting agitated, that we don't let our bias decrease our level of care. Okay. So get to these patients, you know, just like you would in any altered patient or any other patient, you know, rule out uh, anything that we can address to begin with. Okay. So don't let don't let your bias decrease your care. Um, and try, if you can, I mean, this is hard, try not to accept what you're being told. Um, so if law enforcement is saying that this patient's being combative because he's on drugs or something like this, or because of whatever reason, um, assess the patient yourself. Um, evidence in this case suggests that law enforcement officers uh, were communicating information to EMS providers that sort of influenced them to give ketamine. Um, and you can sort of see that on the body cam. Okay, so and also don't let the dispatch information bias you. Um, go in there with a clean slate, um, looking to take care of the patient as you normally would. Assess the patient and intervene. Um, again, in this case, that did not happen. So what? again, the reason for this video is to try to put your mind at ease um, that you're not going to get yourself into a situation um, going out there properly taking care of patients. Um, if we assess the patient, we intervene as we need to, um, we'll always be, you know, be protected. Um, in this case, they didn't assess the, the patient. All they did was intervene um, with, uh, with ketamine. Um, and then finally, you have to advocate for the patient, right? This is your patient. This is not um, somebody that you're taking into custody. This is a patient that you're there to care for. You need to advocate for the patient. Also, you need to talk to each other. In this case, um, the paramedic in, who is in charge asked for 500 milligrams of ketamine. Um, now, I'm not familiar with their protocols, but ketamine is dose uh, weight-based. So I imagine this 
patient's weight was, you know, pretty significantly uh, overestimated. Um, so talk to your partner and say, I'm going to give 500 milligrams of ketamine I am. Do you think that's good? And maybe your partner would say, no, no, this guy looks small. And, you know, and, that, and maybe that would have changed the outcome of this. Again, ketamine is a very, very safe drug. I've seen it um, dosed very high. Um, the, the, the medical examiner in this case indicated that the cause of death was related to ketamine. Um, I don't agree with that um, at all. I think it was ex 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 asphyxia that caused it. But, um, but, you know, it didn't help that the uh, that the prosecution was able to say that they overdosed the patient on ketamine. Um, and so, in conclusion, in this case, um, what can we what could we take out of this? Anytime an intervention is done, it's done in the patient's best interest. Uh, work on we need to work on relationships with police and EMS, um, train with them. Um, so when these cases happen, which they happen frequently, you know, we know how to hand patients off, uh, take patients hand off from law enforcement um, and communicate this patient's mind now um, and, uh, you know, and, and be able to train and work well with them. And finally, assess the patient. I'm sorry, access the patient and then assess the patient um, and use your your equipment um, and then and treat the patient with dignity, as we always do. So this was a. Um, Again, a very rare situation. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard about it. Um, I think there's probably get down the road going to be legislation that hopefully that comes out in Florida that says maybe that you know these cases shouldn't be tried criminally. Um, I don't know what the sentencing is for these paramedics yet, um, but um, but I just wanted to make sure you all know that I recognize this. Um, I'm going to work on further training and, and developing training with law enforcement. Um, but, um, but I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, we had a discussion about it. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. And um, I thank you all very much.